it's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I decided to go into engineering, um, basically uh, almost uh, as an accident. Um, when I was in high school, I thought I wanted to be a particle physicist. Uh, how many of you know what a particle physicist is? Eh, excellent, good number. I didn't. Um, <laughs> I, I don't really know how I came up with this grand vision, but I thought a particle physicist stood in a dark room, kind of like this, like a big one, and there would just be particles whizzing all over the place. Like, in my mind, they were kind of colorful balls glowing all different colors. And then I would just occasionally reach out and grab one and name it. <laughs> this, yeah. And, right, it would be very easy, because they were all over, and I could just grab one. Um, there were about a couple dozen particles known, so if it was that easy, there would be a lot more than a couple dozen. Um, fortunately for me, uh, my first semester of my freshman year of my undergrad, my TA was a particle physicist. So I found this out, and I confessed my dream of being a particle physicist to him, and he told me that I could come with him to work one day. I was, I was really excited, right? I thought I won the lottery. Um, I went with him to work. I decided I did not want to be a particle physicist. <laughs> um, it, it involves looking through reams and reams and reams of data. And this was a long time ago, so the reams were on a computer screen that was black with the green text. Um, and looking for little tiny anomalies in the data and hoping you found one, and then if you found one, hoping that that was a particle and not just some sort of spurious signal from the detector. Um, so in my naivete, I asked him why he didn't just get a better detector, <laughs> right? This, this should be easy. Um, and he said, why don't you go build one? <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, right? I'm 18, I'm like, this sounds, it's a challenge. <laughs> and he's like, Okay, this detector costs like $50 million. I was like, so perhaps not. <laughs> so I, I decided I would go find a new dream. You know, I'm like third week now of my freshman year. So I start wandering around the physics building, knocking on doors, you know, saying, what do you do? Professors love it when you do that, by the way. <laughs> they, they really love it. Um, I discovered two things. Uh, there weren't any girls' bathrooms in the physics building. <laughs> that knowledge served me well over the next four years. Um, I also discovered I didn't necessarily like any of the experiments that they were doing, but I really liked all of their equipment and their instrumentation. And I discovered that I could make a huge contribution to science and engineering by making all of their equipment and instrumentation better. Kind of like building a better detector for all the particle physicists, though I haven't quite contributed there yet. I'm working on it. It's, it's near the bottom of my list. Um, yeah, they were mean to me. Um, yeah, uh, it's good to be nice to people. Um, so that's, that's what I decided to embark on. Um, so I found a dream. And building instruments and building equipment is one thing that engineers do. So that's why I say it's kind of an accident that I decided to become an engineer, because my, my first goal was far from that. Um, but building instruments and building equipment is kind of, sounds very, very vague. Uh, my parents tell me that as well. Um, so one example of an instrument that everyone knows is a microscope. You know, the, the first microscope, you know, was built in the late 17th century. It looks very, very different from microscopes of today. Um, the one that many of you may be familiar with is, you know, kind of the big white thing. You put cells on it. You can watch them wiggle around a little bit. Um, you can look at insects. You know, this is why I chose the microscope. It has lots of pretty pictures. Um, so you can look at insects. You can look at coral. Um, you can look at, this is an example of a fossilized dinosaur bone. Um, and you can look at cells. So this is a group of uh, HeLa cells. So because of all the different colors, you can actually see the structure of the cells, see where the, the nucleus is, see how all the cells interact. And because you can take video on microscopes, you can actually see cells grow. 
Um, however, in the you know, early 20th century, a new type of microscope called an electron microscope was born. Um, so instead of using photons to image, you actually use electrons. Uh, so you can get higher resolution. You can actually see things uh, much, much finer detail. So this picture, even though it looks very, very grainy and noisy, you can actually see the polio virus. So being able to understand the structure of something is critical to being able to understand its function, because without structure and function, you can't understand how to combat something. And being able to create the polio vaccine is obviously incredibly important. And this is another SEM, or a TEM image, so electron microscope image, showing viruses attacking an E. coli cell. So even though it looks kind of like they're just ringing around and forming this very, very nice, pretty image, what's actually going on is a virus has something that's like a needle-like projection, and it actually injects its RNA into the cell. And that's how the cell gets sick. So by taking an image like this, you can actually see the virus attaching on the outside of the cell, and researchers could understand exactly how that happened. And by understanding how it happened, they can come up with ways to block it, and therefore keep everyone in the room healthy. So therefore, instrumentation has been very important, especially in the 20th century, in helping with flu vaccines, but also other challenges. But then, great, you know, instruments helped last century. How are instruments going to help this century? Right? What are the challenges of this century, and how are, how are people like me going to help everyone in society today? So what exactly are the challenges of this century? Well, there's energy. Right? That, that's kind of a huge challenge, right? Both making energy sources more efficient, so making solar energy, wind energy fusion, um, but then also making buildings more efficient, making cars more efficient, so energy from every single angle. There's also clean water and uh, cyber infrastructure and physical infrastructure, and making cyberspace more secure and making uh, our buildings more predictably failureable would be the best word. Um, so basically, every building and every bridge at some point is going to fail. You, everyone needs to, to acknowledge that. Um, <laughs> you're going to have the best mistake is going to happen. Um, but if we can predict when they're going to fail, then we know when to rebuild them. Um, so if we can come up with good ways to predictably model these systems, then, then we're, we're on the right track. And then the third is healthcare. And right now, there's a lot of focus on trying to come up with the best drugs, right? That's why the healthcare industry costs are ballooning, because there are all these excellent drugs which cost a ton of money, but they can prolong your life for three months. But if we can come up with preventative medicine, which we then don't get sick, then that would be even better. And that's one way that you know, personalized medicine kind of has two, two thrusts in it, right? If you can come up with a personalized therapeutic, which is targeted just towards you, but also personalized preventative medicine. So you know what will make you sick, so then you can prevent it, so then you don't even need the drugs. So, so that, it's, it has two thrusts, both therapeutics, but also preventative health care. It would also help if we all ran a little bit more. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that's my own pitch. That's, Z has nothing to do with that. Um, so over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years, researchers have been working on developing a set of materials, which we can use as kind of like the new building blocks of the next generation of instruments. And they're nanomaterials. So nanomaterials have a lot of very unique properties, which conventional materials like steel and aluminum don't. And by leveraging some of the really cool properties of nanomaterials, we'll be able to create the next generation of instruments. So a lot of nanomaterials, like, for example, the one in the, eh, from your angle, upper right-hand corner, um, if you deflect it, it actually generates electrons, um, which, you know, now you could imagine building an instrument that doesn't need battery. Or the one in the middle, when you shine UV light on it, it changes color. So you, and you don't need to have a battery on it to make it light up. So a lot of these materials are able to address a lot of the problems which face society simply because of their inherent material properties. And all of these materials are now just ready and waiting to be used. So I mentioned the uh, really cool material that generates energy. So it's actually something called a zinc oxide nanowire. You don't need to remember that whole thing. Um, so it grows up from a substrate kind of like grass, and it forms these very beautiful parallel rays. And then you can seal it in between some gold. And then as you bend it, it actually makes electricity. So it, it basically is a battery that will last forever. You never need to recharge it. And researchers are looking at using this uh, to put in pacemakers to make your pacemaker rechargeable. Because right? as you walk, you're going to deflect it. It'll generate energy. 
and then you have a pacemaker that you don't need to take out and replace the battery on. So it's, it's a good idea. Uh, the researchers first did their proof of concept by putting it on a hamster. And they showed that when the hamster ran, the hamster would be able to generate energy. And it has a really adorable video that goes along with it. And I show it to my undergrads, right? Because I teach an, an undergrad class in nanomaterials. And my, when I show the video to my undergrads, they say, oh, if we can generate like, you know, a milliwatt of power with one hamster, we could generate gigawatts of power with all the rats in LA. <laughs> it's, it's creative thinking. Yeah. If we can catch the rats in LA and generate a gigawatt of power, we could also catch the rats in LA and just kill them all. <laughs> yeah. So, the, another example is a, uh, is a new type of microscope. So the image in the, uh, the upper left is actually the microscope, the whole thing. So no more lenses, no more focusing knobs, no more objectives. The entire camera, the entire sample stage, everything is on that little dime-sized chip. And you're actually able to get images which are just as good as a normal microscope. Another big difference, that microscope costs $1.50 not several thousands of dollars. Um, so, yeah, it might not replace the, you know, conventional 3D optical microscope, but that microscope will have huge applications in places like Africa, where they want to be able to look at water and see, are there li living, squiggling things roaming around in the water which could, you know, perhaps be live bacteria? If so, you know, are they actually alive? Are they dead? Are they the kind of bacteria which are going to kill me? You know, a $1.50 microscope? They can afford that. A $40,000 microscope, not so much. So that's, that has a huge impact. And they've actually taken that now and integrated it in with an iPhone. Increase the cost above $1.50. I'll give you that. OK. So the, the last example um, is something that is allowing researchers to actually push it past the single cell and single virus limit. We're now looking at single proteins and single DNA strands. So being able to look at individual cells and individual viruses will allow us to study you know, the structure of a virus or the structure of a cell, but a cell can have a couple thousand to a million molecules in it, and they're all interacting kind of like a small city. And it's very hard to understand how each of those proteins are interacting with each other and how that communication pathway can affect the overall behavior of a cell. So researchers really are interested in studying how protein A affects behavior of protein B and how protein B later on can affect the behavior of protein C and understanding all of those complex signaling pathways and cascading behavior, which can, in the end, one signaling protein can come into a cell and initiate a hundred different pathways, which could, in the end, either kill a cell, make it stronger, make it replicate, initiate all kinds of changes. So researchers are now beginning to develop new types of instruments which actually have this capability and which are really going to play a key role in preventative medicine. So I hope I've given you just a little glimpse of what's kind of on the horizon. Um, and there are a lot of resources which are sponsored by your tax dollars, so you should take advantage of them. Um, so one of them is the uh, National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenges website, also the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which they're the people that advise the president. Um, and then the National Nanotechnology Initiative, which is all about nano all the time. Thank you very much.